Uh, hello, everybody. Professor Fiore here. Today's topic, biquad filter. <sighs> the crowd goes crazy. What's the deal with the biquad filter? What is it? Well, if you take a look at the schematic, it would be understandable if you confused it with a state variable filter. It looks a lot like a state variable filter. And in fact, I'm going to do a state variable filter first, just to kind of get your mind in gear, then we can see what the differences are, right? Essentially, what we've got is a circuit that uses a couple of integrators. We've got two op amps that are set up as integrators, right? And so that's going to give us a single pole response for each. In other words, we're going to have a dual pole or 12 dB per octave kind of response, right? You are going to be able to get very high Q out of this circuit. If for a band pass, which is what it would normally be used for, you can get very, very high Qs out of the biquad filter. It, in fact, has multiple outputs. There is a low pass filter, which is of marginal utility, I will say, but it has two band pass outputs, um, one that's in phase and one that's out of phase. And I'm, what I mean is, at the resonant frequency, it's in phase, zero degrees or out of phase, 180 degrees compared to the input. Obviously, at other frequencies, you're not going to see that exact in phase or out of phase characteristic. All right. So before we jump into the biquad, let's warm up here with a little bit of a state variable filter. So this is the four op amp version of a state variable. Integrator number one, integrator number two. We have a summing amplifier back here. And then the fourth op amp, which is actually optional. This is if you want um, independent Q adjustment. You don't have to have this. But if you remember what's going on here, you know, if we start here at the, uh, the output, right? This is a low pass output. So this output is falling um, as frequency increases at 12 dB um, per octave. This gets fed back in with the input signal. Okay, and if you think in terms of um, you know, a sum on that, what you'll end up with is a high pass response. Right? Think, in, think in terms of subtracting that off from the input, right? And what you wind up with is basically a high pass response. Right? So this will also be a 12 dB per octave, but in this case, as you go down in frequency, because it's high pass. And then if you integrate that, so this whole curve gets thrown on another 6 dB per octave, increasing frequency. So that turns into a band pass. In other words, you've got 6 dB ultimate roll off per octave at low frequencies and at high frequencies. But the damping part of it, right, the Q adjust, can produce a high resonance in the middle, right, at the center frequency. And this has, obviously, the three outputs, right, independent outputs, um, high pass, band pass, low pass. Uh, they're all tuned to the same frequency. So when I, say when I say that they're independent, I mean um, they're discrete outputs, but you can't have them at different frequencies. All right. If you want to tune this, the tuning for the filter is based on the integrators. So R1, R2, which would normally be set to the same value, and C1, C2, again, normally set to the same value. All right. So I'm not going to go any deeper than that. There is a separate video on the state variable filter if you want to watch that. If this is unfamiliar, right? Strongly suggest that you do. And I would say before we continue that as a general filter, the state variable is probably a little bit more useful than the biquad. The biquad has kind of a unique characteristic about it, which we'll get to in just a sec, right? So again, this could be a three op amp version. Now let's move over to the biquad. So. I do have the three op amp version here, okay, <laughs> basic bi quad filter. Um, so don't let the fact that there's three op amps think in terms of, oh, that's a huge advantage. Well, not really, because we could have had a three op amp version of the state variable. So three outputs, right? There's a low pass output, and then the in phase and the out of phase band pass, okay? Integrator, integrator. But notice that the, what was the input summing amplifier is now just an inverting amplifier. And the summing is actually taking place in the third stage. In other words, think of this as sort of a, a summing integrator in a way, right? You got two inputs, and this is the integrator. And then we've added this extra resistor, R3, in the, in the feedback position, the RF position, which is going to help us control damping on this thing. Now, normally, you would set this up like, uh, like you did with the state variable. 
such that R1 and R2 are the same value, right? I've got 10K and 10K, and then C1 and C2 would also be the same value, right? Now, if you go through the calculations, which we'll get to in a sec, because I kind of focus on this section of it right here with the calculations, just remember that if you monkey with the value of R2, when you get all done, make sure you reset your R1 and your C1, of course, to the value of, of um, R2 and C2, right? This must be true. Otherwise, funky things are going to happen with your filter. So basically, we set up the center frequency, the bandpass, with R2, C2. And what I have here, a 10K and a 10, uh, 10 nano, is going to give us approximately 1.59 kilohertz for a resonant frequency. Then it's what's nice here is that the ratio of two resistors, R3 and R2, is what sets the Q. All right, so this is a 100K over 10K. That's going to give us a Q of 10. And as I said, biquad filters are capable of producing very high Qs. You can get a Q of 100 out of this thing. Okay, nice and stable. Try doing that with a multiple feedback filter. Well, don't, because it probably won't work well. But in any case, um, the other thing is you can set the uh, gain at the resonant frequency again, with just two resistors, that's R3 and R4. So I want that to be zero. In other words, at the resonant frequency, I want zero dB gain, gain of unity, right? So that's R3 over R4, which is 100K over 100K or one, okay? Now, here's kind of a funky thing that you don't see in a state variable or many other filters. And that is, if you decide that you're gonna change R2, and of course R1 along with it, so that you want to, you want to change the, the center frequency, right? Notice that, yeah, here's the R2, and by implication, R1, but that also appears in the Q equation, okay? So what ends up happening is you wind up, whatever, whatever the factor is that you changed the, the center frequency, you also wind up changing the Q. So what ends up happening ultimately is that the bandwidth in terms of hertz, not as a percentage, but in terms of hertz, doesn't change. So, you know, here we are at, at um, one kilohertz and a Q of 10. So when you divide that out, right, the bandwidth is gonna be a thousand hertz. Now, if we bump this up to two kilohertz, all right, what ends up happening is we'll still wind up with that same one kilohertz bandwidth because the Q is going to move in the opposite direction, right? So we're, so we're going to, um, unlike a scaling, like you would expect in a lot of filters where these things kind of go in step, so that what ends up happening, like in a state variable, when you, when you change the center frequency, um, the Q stays where it is, so the bandwidth would increase along with an increase in center frequency or it would decrease with a decrease in center frequency. So, you know, like if you think of it in terms of an octave, you know, or a fraction of an octave, oh, my, my bandwidth is, is um, you know, half an octave, or let's say like you're doing, uh, you know, a, a half octave uh, graphic EQ or something like that, right? Um, that would be consistent as you moved, as you scaled this up and down the spectrum. That's not what happens here, right? You get the same number of Hertz and there are certain applications where you might want to do that, you know, have a bank of filters and you want every single one of them to have, you know, a, a 100 hertz bandwidth, let's say, okay? All right, so um, let's see what we get out of this, right? I'm gonna run in and do the usual AC analysis. Let's see what we get. Okay, bring this over here, stretch it out so we can see it a little better. And let's get a uh, little legend over here. Put it right there. Okay. Um, all right. So the first thing you notice, you know, there's three curves over here for phase, but it looks like we're only seeing two for the amplitude part of it. What the heck is going on? Well, basically these two, the antiphase and the in phase, have the exact same uh, shape. Okay. So that's this maroon. So one is actually laid on top of the other. All right. If you don't believe that... You can just separate the curves and, you know, well, this is in the way now. Get over there. Get over there! Um, you can see what's happening, right? Here's the antiphase and the in-phase, and it's the same exact curve, all right? But when you come down here and look at the phase shifts, you see, oh, yeah, this, this one, you know, look where this is, look where this one is, 
right? These things are um, uh, 180 degrees out of phase, right? Beautiful. I kind of like that. Let's collect these back up. Okay. Now notice when we look at the uh, peak gain on here, right? So this, like we said, I tuned this up 10 nanofarads, 10, uh, 10 K ohms. Uh, that should be about 1.59 kilohertz. And in fact, you know, let's just be persnickety about it and I'll get a, uh, get over there, get a cursor on it. And there you go, right? There's our 1.59 right at the peak. That looks good. Um, and this will fall off after the initial sharp bit due to the, due to the, the damping, the Q, right? This falls off at basically 6 dB per octave on either side. Now notice what's happening here on the low pass, right? The green one. This thing is coming down. It's, it's band pass section is minus 20 dB. You know, why is that of interest? Well, basically it's the, the reciprocal, right? Uh, that's one-tenth of what that um, uh, resistor ratio happens to be. Okay, um, let me just kind of move this out of the way. So look, here's your R2 and your R3 ratio, okay? So if you think of this in reverse, it's 10K over 100K. In other words, flip this and you get one-tenth, right? Which is minus 20 dB. So you can think of this whole thing as just sort of being pushed down enough so that the peak, which would have been at plus 20, is now at zero, okay? That's essentially the way of thinking about it. And there are your, uh, like I said, the bank of phase shifts, okay? So the idea of having this sort of um, anti-phase kind of output cap capability is, you know, sort of the attractive thing here along with this, this funky, the way in which it um, scales, okay? The way in which it, it, it uh, scales the bandwidth as you go up and around, okay? All right. Um, you know, as far as the general function, it's kind of, in some respects, it's kind of like the, the integrator. You know, if you start thinking in terms of, well, here's a bandpass signal, and then I invert it, then what's over here, all right? This is the antiphase. I'm just going to start here, right? This is the antiphase uh, signal, and we, pay, we run this back here through an inverter, so this should be in phase, right? I, I inverted the antiphase, so whoop, there's our in phase signal. Then we integrate it. So what happens? Same thing that we saw in the state variable. Once you integrate it, it's like you're tilting this thing kind of like clockwise because this is rolling off at 6 dB per octave as, as frequency increases. So the minus 6 on the high end turns into minus 12, and then the minus 6 in the other direction at the low end basically cancels out and it gets flat. All right, so that's why we see that sort of flat low frequency. We wind up with a low pass, low pass output. Okay, then we take that and we combine it up with the um, input signal, right? And that combination will wind up with the uh, antiphase bandpass that we originally saw, right? So you take that, um, that low pass signal, that low frequency signal, and you essentially subtract that from the input and you wind up with this, this uh, sort of bandpass uh, antiphase signal, all right? Um, this is actually a nice one to kind of monkey around with. You put it in the simulator and then, you know, look at various points. And then you can, uh, like I said, start scaling things. So basically, as far as the design is concerned, start here, set the R2 and the C2 to the frequencies that you want, you know, with decent sized components, because you don't want crazy sized components. Whatever you come up with, just remember, you're going to have to do the same thing over here. All right. If you don't, by the way, if you forget to do that, weird things are going to happen. When you start to scale it, instead of them scaling by the same factor, it'll start scaling by the square root of that factor. So if you were to, you know, like come up with a value of R2 and then you said, oh, I'm going to, you know, increase this by a factor of 10. Well, instead of getting a critical frequency change by a factor of 10, you'll only get a, a round of three because it'll be a square root of 10. Right. So. Once you establish R2 and C2, just make sure you go back and, and set R1 and C1 to the same values. Um, in any case, once you've got your critical frequency, you can figure out, hey, let me, let me uh, sort of monkey with my value of R3 to get the Q that I want, right? 
How tight do I want that? And then depending on where you want that um, response in terms of um, th that center frequency, you know, in terms of wh whether or not you want gain, you can come in here and set the value of R4, right? It's because you've got the R2, which is going to tell you what the R3 is to get the Q. And then once you've got that, once you've got the R3 and you know what, what you want for the gain, you got your R4, right? This is ordinary gain, of course, not decibel gain. All right? Beauty. So hope you enjoyed this one. It's a little bit different. It's not, not a filter that you see a lot of. All right? But it's, it has its applications. You know, sometimes it's good to have these sort of weird little tools in your toolkit. All right? Any questions? Put them out in the comments, and we'll see you next time.